This episode is brought to you by Progressive. Are you driving your car or doing the laundry right now? Podcasts go best when they're bundled with another activity, like Progressive Home and Auto Policies. They're best when bundled too. Having these two policies together makes insurance easier and could help you save. Customers who save by switching their home and car insurance to Progressive save over $775 on average. Quote a home and car bundle today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $779 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Not available in all states. Okay, it's official. We are very much in the final sprint to Election Day. And face it, between debates, polling releases, even court appearances, it can feel exhausting, even impossible to keep up with. I'm Brad Milkey. I'm the host of Start Here, the daily podcast from ABC News. And every morning, my team and I get you caught up on the day's news in a quick, straightforward way that's easy to understand with just enough context so you can listen, get it, and go on with your day. So kickstart your morning. Start smart with Start Here and ABC News because staying informed shouldn't feel overwhelming. Hi, I'm Adam Gopnik, the the writer. And uh, I, Kara and I just had a wonderful conversation about everything from uh, guitar chords to homework to the meaning of life and beyond. Uh, um, I hope you'll enjoy it. I did. Hi, friends. Welcome back to Really Famous. Today, I'm talking to Adam Gopnik. Adam is a staff writer at The New Yorker, and he's written for The New Yorker since 1986. So yeah, he's pretty well established. He has three National Magazine Awards for essays and for criticism. And he's the author of a whole bunch of best-selling books, including Paris to the Moon, which I read uh, a few years back. Adam just published a new book, called All That Happiness Is, Some Words on What Matters. Not surprisingly, I'm into the topic of happiness. As you know, I'm a therapist, I'm a mental health expert. So what's better than talking about happiness? If you'd like a copy of any of Adam's books, head to my Amazon shop, amazon.com slash shop slash really famous. I have them all spotlighted right there. So you can just click and boom, buy your book and support really famous at the same time. Because if you recall, When you shop through my Amazon link, Amazon pays us a tiny commission for everything you buy. You don't pay any more, but it gives us a little help. And now a quick word from our sponsors before we get into my chat with Adam Gopnik. All right, here we go. I love the books. I would expect nothing less from you behind you. A great array of books. Well, I have books, but I also, you see, I have a photograph here. People often ask me what that, who that is, because they, it looks like Italian anarchist but it's actually the marx brothers when they were very young and handsome really okay so why is the marx brothers your primary photo i'll bring it a little closer you can see just how you would know it was the marx brothers because they look so handsome and young uh i love the marx brothers they grew up not far from here at all and i just love the contradiction that this great uh comedy uh surrealist comedy team looks like 20th century avant-garde anarchists as i say so i just i it's always a surprise because people say well who is that because as i say it looks like the italian futurists but it's actually the marxists all right that's very cool and all the books also tell me about these books have you read every one of them at least once yes i mean without without yeah they're all i have a horrible time getting rid of books so the section that's right behind my head is both pop music books american musical in their lives, an anthology about the Beatles that I contributed to, a great book about American popular song, Fiddler on a book about Fiddler on the Roof. So all of these are music books. And all of this is, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> memoirs that I like, Frank O'Connor and so on, Louis McNeese. So it has a certain order. And yes, I've I have read them all, but not been able to rid myself of them. That's my problem. Reading reading is easy, reading is difficult. Right. And you live in Manhattan, correct? Live in Manhattan on the on the Upper East Side on what's called Carnegie Hill. That's 
uh, Madison Avenue, north of 86th Street and south of 110th. And you wouldn't live anywhere else, I'm guessing, or maybe Paris again? Yeah, Paris would be the is, would be the other place that I love that I have lived in and love, but it would be either New York or Paris. Yes. Why? Oh, I mean, all, you know, the reasons would be all horrible cliches. I, I love cities. I love the intensity, the density, the variety, the pluralism, the kind of intrinsic pluralism of cities. And of all those cities, and I love many cities, I love San Francisco. Where are you speaking from? So right now I'm in Los Angeles. So well, I, I go back Los and forth a bit. I love Los Angeles. You know, New Yorkers are supposed to not like Los Angeles, as in any hall. But I love Los Angeles because Los Angeles always seems to me to be a, a, a civilization onto itself. There's a great book by, a, um, which is probably down there, by a writer, an architectural historian named Rainer Banham about the expressway in the city. He wrote it back in the 1960s. And he pointed out, you know, that Los Angeles isn't a worse city. It's just a very different kind of city. And I always love L.A. when I'm there. Um, but given that I'm a pedestrian in the first instance, I know how to drive now, but I didn't most of my life. Um, given that I'm a pedestrian in the first instance and that I love the act of walking, bumping into people, all of those wonderful, uh, what do we call them, weak ties that we encounter where you bump into someone you haven't seen in six weeks but or longer, and but you re-strike a conversation. Um, uh, you know, verticality, density, plurality, all of those New York virtues I, I I love. And I also love a certain kind of um, funky inconsequence. I don't know what else to call it that's part of New York. After I speak to you today, I'm going to get on the subway for a full hour, two subways I have to take, to go to Williamsburg in Brooklyn, which is, you know, the old uh, Hasidic neighborhood, which is now a combination of Hasidim, Orthodox Jews, and hipsters. And I'm going to go there to... Uh, box for an hour with my wonderful boxing teacher, Joey Contrada, who was one of the heroes of my last book, The Real Work, because uh, that's where Joey hangs out. And I wouldn't want to box with anyone else. So it's a massive schlep all the way out there. But it's um, uh, uh, it's worth it. It's worth it. And you go through all the funky, to put it politely, experience of the subways and long walk through the uh, Brooklyn streets, this neighborhood very much in transition. I find all of that yeah. thrilling. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so much flavor, right? And it's different flavor. Yeah. So it's exactly. a whole mix of different things. And it's like one flavor, the next block, it's another flavor and another flavor. Exactly. It's delicious. Exactly. And, and unfortunately, Manhattan, where I came of age, and I wrote a whole book about it um, at the Stranger's Gate, was like that, had that kind of variety when I was coming of age in Soho, when it was still very much a village of art, with a mix of art galleries and up and coming restaurants and lofts for grumpy artists and so on. Now much more homogenized, but a neighborhood like Williamsburg still has some of that character. One block exactly as you say is all Hasidim. The next mm -hmm. block is a hipster cafe. The next block is a Whole Foods. There's a radical book bookstore. There's a guy selling uh, vintage paperbacks on the corner um, and I stop and sign my own when I when I walk by him. You, do, you just pick it up and sign it or does he ask he, you or he what? He saves them up. He knows that I come from the subway on my way to the boxing gym that way too. So he has some kind of lying in wait for me when he has one of my books and I I, I cheerfully, cheerfully sign. Um, you know, Philip Roth, the great um, American novelist, um, never signed his books. It was a principle. He was not, he was not grumpy, he just was firm as a person, except there was a guy with an outdoor book stall on 80th and Broadway. And Philip would always sign that guy's books because he liked his the cut of his jib, the fact that he was out there on the street uh, selling old novels. So yes, all of those aspects of New York I love and would could not imagine living without. Yeah, how interesting. And you've seen it change, obviously, a lot over oh, the years. Oh my God, yes. I've seen it change cyclically. Uh, over time. When uh, I first arrived here in the late 70s, when my wife and I moved here in 1980, it was, uh, you know, it was the city very much still of taxi driver. It was the city of Annie Hall on the one hand, but it was also the city of Martin Scorsese's taxi driver. It was scary, you know, steam coming out of the manholes, psychos everywhere you looked, danger at least seeming to lurk behind every corner. And that kind of dialogue between uh, uh, danger and delight was very powerful. You know, you'd uh, but then we went through the enormous 
uh, upward transformation of New York, where crime fell for reasons that I've often studied, but are still in some ways mysterious. Crime fell vertiginously. We now, um, and the city became uh, safer than it had been at any time since uh, the 19th century. And then uh, we went through that, which people, de you know, deplored the talked about the suburbanization of New York, the the gentrification of New York. And now we're going through the, in the opposite direction. So that um, uh, disturbingly, but truly there, you know, is a, uh, clearly there's an enormous homeless, homeless problem again. And even more, there's a, the kind of long tail of the opioid crisis is visible on New York streets in the form of a, uh, helpless people who are clearly um, drug addicted, drug addled and can seem um, menacing, even if, in fact, they're merely uh, uh, pitiful. Uh, so we've gone through many cycles in the space mm -hmm. of uh, 40 years in New York. Yeah, it is so interesting. And you, you're so aware of everything. I mean, you're constantly looking at all of it and analyzing all of it, right? You have that kind of mind that, like, you're just always... That's nice in. of you. Yeah, it's nice of you to say, but I yes, I think that's true. I, I once said... I don't know if I've ever published this, but I've said it anyway, that, that there are kind of two sort. I mean, there are a million kinds of intelligence, but one way of dividing intelligence is that people have a vertical intelligence, people have a horizontal intelligence. I see it in my two kids. My son, who's a, a musician and a philosopher, has a very vertical intelligence. He focuses um, uh, powerfully on one thing at a time. He wants to understand it, whether it's a, a paradox in Wittgenstein or a Bach um cantata on guitar he wants to understand it from its roots up to the top of the tree and he'll focus on that i don't have that kind i have a horizontal intelligence and my daughter is like that too when you give me a here i'm conscious of z as we say in canada where i was raised over here and yes so i'm i'm both without false modesty adept at making those horizontal connections but I also relish them. I love them. Maybe that's one reason why I love cities so much, because they are constructed with that kind of horizontality, exactly as we were discussing. What's on the next block is always going to be surprising. And I love, as a literary exercise, that business of connecting uh, seemingly unrelated things, you know, of saying this may seem as though it's yeah. A, but really it's it's wormhole close to, to, to Z. I, I enjoy that as an exercise. Yeah, very analytical. So you're like a very analytical person as well. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm 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 more intuitive than analytic in lots of ways. Um, uh, uh, but yes, analytic certainly in the sense that I when a something happens in life, I like to overthink it. To use the kid right. expression, the kids have. I don't believe it's possible to overthink things. I think that's why we're here is to think and think again and then think some more. Okay, a couple of things that you said I have to go back to. So one was, okay, analytical versus intuitive. So you feel like they are not, they can't, they're not, they're not together. They're two separate things that are often you're oh, one or the other. Oh, sure, they're together. I just meant that there's a certain kind of analytic intelligence that is consciously sort of clinically in the business of dissecting things apart. Um, it's an example of that. Well, I, you know, remember the late... Uh, Danny Hahnemann, the, the great economist, won the Nobel Prize, had that kind of close order analytic intelligence. He would take apart a puzzle or conundrum in that way. Um, when I say intuitive, I don't mean it's not analytic. I just mean that the uh, the leaps, the uh, spied connections between things, the sort of metaphysical bridges right. between things kind of come into your head in a in a moment's flash rather than being something that you uh that you study for a long time to produce a thought maybe I just a way of saying i'm a i'm a sloppy rather than a meticulous Interesting. right because i think of myself i'll just insert myself into this as Please. both i'm very intuitive like that's my main way of interacting with the world or with people i think especially with people um right. but at the same time i think Think, and I'm not analytical in that way where you said you really break things down. Like I'm not like that at all, but I analyze things. I draw parallels or conclusions between different concepts or different things. So I think of them as going together, but I see the difference in what you're, what you're saying about analytical yeah. getting to the nitty gritty. Okay. Absolutely. The other thing, the other thing that I was uh, going to pick up on was weak ties, right? Those weak ties. 
I love that concept. And there's more, there's more um, evidence, I guess, supporting the fact that weak ties are very good for your mental yeah. health. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It was one of the things I think we all missed in the pandemic, right, was bumping into people uh, on the street. We did it still virtually. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I think um, I wrote an essay once called Bumping Into Mr. Ravioli. And it was when my daughter, Olivia, I mentioned before, is three years old, and she invented an imaginary friend for herself who was always too busy to play with her. His name was Charlie Ravioli, but he was a New Yorker. So he was, you know, always, she was always on her little uh, play cell phone saying, you know, uh, Ravioli, Ravioli, this is Olivia. And she would hang up and say, I always get his machine. Uh, because she made up a world of misconnections out of um, the experience, the life she saw her mother or father having. And one of the points I made in that essay is that, which was called Bumping Into Charlie Ravioli, is that you're, we're in New York, we're always bumping into people. And that's part of the pleasure of it. And Olivia would say that about her imaginary friend at the end of the day. Say, how was your day, darling? You knew her day was spent indoors and then at the zoo in Central Park. And she'd, she said, oh, it's fine. She said, I bumped into Charlie Ravioli because she knew that that was the rhythm of the New York day was bumping into people. And yes, exactly. Those are our weak ties. And absolutely, it's part of the um, salubriousness of city life. Exactly. Is, is that we don't just have those few strong familial ties that root us in place, though we have those as well, perhaps. But we have those myriad, countless uh, uh, weak ties, the uh, relationships with the uh, flower vendor, the the so to speak, the butcher and the baker, the the um, person we bump into when we're biking, your boxing coach, the mm -hmm. uh, the other people in the boxing gym who, though utterly unlike, it's hilarious because I'm, a, you know, um, a short Jewish intellectual in my sixties, and everybody else in the boxing gym is a strong. Um, uh, Hispanic, Latino, Asian uh, fighter, Muay Thai fighter in their twenties, but we form a little a little weak community of weak ties. And yes, exactly. I think it's incredibly uh, healthy for us. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And you, it's interesting to me because you're really striking me as such a conversationalist and very, uh, you have so, all these ideas, which a lot of writers have, obviously lots of ideas, but many writers are not that uh, oh, simple word talkative, right? They don't really feel as comfortable speaking about their ideas as they do writing about them. Do you find that too? Or like, I feel like- No, I, you know, it's one of the, the obnoxious idiosyncrasies that I possess, I suppose, is I like talking and I don't find, uh, I don't find it difficult to, I'm, to perform in that sense. I was a child actor, you know. I was, when I was a kid, I did a lot of, uh, I mean, a little kid. Uh, uh, six to 12, particularly, I did a lot of TV commercials and stage work and so on. So I always feel there's a lot of ham in me and I like to perform in that way. And at a deeper level, you know, at a more artistic level, um, I think that the test of, uh, of good writing is its quality of voice. I write about that, I think, in, the, in this book uh, a bit. So I like the idea that your spoken voice and your written voice should be more or less continuous if you can make them that way. You shouldn't mm -hmm. have one voice that you use on the page and another voice that you articulate. Having said that, I've known lots of uh, first-rate writers who are totally unlike their page self when you meet them in person. I uh, I edited for a long time at The New Yorker a great writer named Whitney Ballian, not well enough known now, who wrote about jazz and could evoke the, uh, the sounds of jazz players with an uncanny poetic uh, perfection. And when you read him on page, you think, wow, this is the most um, urbane and uh, agreeable companion you could imagine to go to a jazz bar with. But in life, though, he was the sweetest of men. He was a sort of painfully shy, very waspy, a slightly awkward and nervous guy. And he expelled all of that from his persona. And on the page, he became this matchlessly urbane, Hoagie Carmichael of, of letters. So sometimes many many writers have a, a spoken voice that sits at right angles to their uh, written voice, but mine, for good or ill, seems to be more or less uh, continuous.
Yeah, I think that's great. It's kind of surprising, I think, because I haven't heard you in an interview before. So I, I guess I was sort of putting a, um, I was sort of believing ahead of time what was going to happen, which I don't usually do with my guests. But yeah, it, it strikes me how, uh, what a good conversationalist you are too, and your voice is clear. So let's talk about your book, right? It's, it's a Absolutely. fabulous topic. I actually have it here. My goodness, Perfect. can you imagine? I have it right by my <laughs> All that Zoom. happiness is. As how, do you have a big stack of them? Have you signed them, or you oh, just have one? No, no, they just the first few arrived from the publisher, so it happens to be happens to be sitting here. That's great. So I read it. I read a PDF, so I read it on my phone. Do you have any right. opinion about that? Like reading something on your phone versus reading? Well, you know, I copy? have to do a lot of that in my work, right? Because when I'm writing about books for the New Yorker, inevitably there, I have to read them before they're published, or often read them before they're published. So I end up reading a lot of PDFs on my phone or on my laptop. Um, and it's fine, you know, it's a, it's the way we read now. I still prefer whenever I can to read a book. I like the physical experience of the book. And I also think in the, some ways, it's just a superior technology, just judges the technology. Because with a book, you can go back and forth, you can turn down pages, you can own it, possess it, inhabit it, if you like, in a way that's much harder to do with a PDF. So I still prefer books, but I, do 90% of my professional reading on, on PDFs now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So the happiness book. So, uh, so I'm a therapist. You should also know that, I guess, because so it's interesting to me. It's especially interesting to me, this topic of happiness and where it derives from. And also is happiness the goal, right? That's another question too. Is happiness even the ultimate goal or are we chasing something that's not even as fulfilling as we think? What, what's your, what's your stance on that? Well, in the book, what I try to say, all that happiness is, is the title, not this is happiness. All that happiness is, mm -hmm. is sort of uh, an exclusionary title in the sense, meaning all that happiness is, is the act of absorption in my experience. Now, there are lots of, lots of pleasures and joys in life from sex to food to child rearing and so on. But the quality that I think we all share and that we recognize as moments of happiness in our own lives almost always involves moments when we escape ourselves, uh, when we're when we suddenly look around and say, "Has four hours gone by?" or when we we don't want to leave the rehearsal room because it's it's so profoundly uh, engrossing is what we say, but really it's a kind of um, escapism, the kind of escape that we get. Uh, from it. And so I was trying to, in writing this book, I was thinking about moments of that kind when we uh, lose ourselves in what I call an accomplishment. And uh, in by losing ourselves, losing our self-consciousness, losing our even our sense of time, achieving that state that some psychologists call the flow, that by losing ourselves, we find ourselves, that we that we develop uh by losing ourselves in some accomplishment, we find ourselves as more self-confident people. I give the example in the book, as you know, of the key moment in my life when I, for the first time, picked up a $40 folk guitar uh, and uh, played uh, played three chords. I didn't play them. I taught myself laboriously over the space of a week, sitting on my bed in my bedroom in Montreal I, with a big book of Beatle songs in front of me. I pain literally painfully because you know your fingers on steel strings are are tender uh how to play these three chords because i wanted to be a beetle and i wanted to learn how to play yellow submarine and rain and you know simple songs and i did i actually still have the guitar a guitar like it right right here um you know and so this wasn't planning on making it a, a show and tell but it, it it comes alive much more if i show you right that this is my uh, folk guitar, and you know, you try and learn. Can you see the fingers? You try and learn yeah. a C chord, a G chord, and a C chord. D C G. Right? It's a very simple um, a sequence. But you got to learn to form these three fingers in a little kind of circle shape without touching that string. Right? Mm -hmm. So you get all of that, and then the G chord is a bitch, right? Because you got to stretch your little finger all the way out here mm -hmm. while pressing down. So it, it took me, you know, I'm doing it now for you, but it took me weeks and weeks and weeks to get even rudimentary understanding of how you how you do those things. And yet that was the hap one of the happiest times of my life because the harmony of Beatles songs was there suddenly at my fingertips, literally. 
It was this mysterious thing that came out of the phonograph. And suddenly I realized, oh, no, it's the relation of all these buzzing and vibrating strings creates this world, not just of sound, very sound, very secondarily, of feeling, of emotion, of uh, access to uh, what had been before that a wholly alien world of accomplishment, the Beatles, that now was in my lap. And so um, those feelings, I think, are fundamental to our uh, perception of happiness. Uh, they're not just vocational. In fact, they're usually not vocational. I'm not a professional guitarist. I never became a professional guitarist. I write songs as a kind of secondary uh, activity, what I call in the book, the the, the violin of Angra, right? That we can talk about. But uh, it was through those experiences that I not only had my first uh, profound sense of inner worth that's produced by accomplishment, of self-escape and inner worth, but uh, it gave me the kind of confidence that enabled me to do everything else I've ever done since. Nothing will ever be harder or more important than learning the three chords mm -hmm. I just played for you. And I think that that's a remarkably um, a transitive experience. In other words, I've rarely met anyone who has had any kind of fulfillment in life uh, who doesn't remember a key moment. I talk in the book about how there's a wonderful Scottish poet named Don Patterson who grew up in a very simple, alcoholic, uh, evangelical, working-class family in Scotland. And he discovered origami, Japanese origami, of all things, at the age of 11 or 12. And he became obsessed with making paper elephants and uh, pelicans in the same way that I became obsessed with the pattern of, of um, guitar. And just as I didn't become a professional guitarist, but I would put the mastery of those three chords as the foundation of everything I've, I've accomplished since, I think Don Patterson, though he never became an origami artist, centers his life around the moment of accomplishing origami. Um, my wife uh, uh, had the same experience as a young woman. She loved uh, beautiful clothes, couldn't afford them, and taught herself how to sew, how to turn those those very intimidating looking butterick patterns into actual uh, dresses. Uh, and she's not a seamstress nor in fashion, but again, she has that same relationship to that moment in her life. Yeah. So that's a very lengthy answer to the question of what is happiness. Happiness, in my view, is closer to good kind of happiness. The happiness that, that sticks with us, that forms a foundation for what we want to do, is closer to a search for meaning rather than a search for uh, material stimulation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So interesting. Do you, is it, is it the, when you're in that flow state or in the zone, is it that, or is it the fact that you're in the, in that flow state and then you get, then you actually do accomplish it. So you learn it. You actually heard the Beatles music. She actually saw the clothing come to life. What if you don't get to that point? Like, do you think that's still, you know what I mean? If you don't succeed. Uh, well, in a it. sense, Kara, you never get to that point, right? You never are good enough. You never are good enough, right? There's always somebody that is going to plant their flag to your left or right so much better than you are or worse than you are. And that's true right through life, no matter how accomplished you become at it, right? That that nobody reaches the peak uh, uh, accomplishment. And even if you, in a certain sense you have, you know, I'm a, if I say so myself, again, with no false modesty at my advanced age. I'm a very accomplished writer, but there are other writers who I emulate and admire. And even more important than that, than the competitive relationship with others, my ambitions for my writing remain so enormous that no matter how accomplished I am, I can only internalize the space between my ambition and uh -huh. how far and where I've gotten so far, right? There's always a higher mountain that you, that you dream of climbing. Uh, so, uh, I don't think that it's, I, I would find it in, unlikely, I, you know, human beings come in limitless kinds and shapes that anybody who perseveres at anything won't find some sense of satisfaction and meaning in doing it at any age. You know, one of the moving things for me, Kara, about having been out on the road with my previous book, The Real Work, is the last thing I intended was a book about accomplishment, about learning how to do things. And the last thing I intended or expected was that it would become a, a popular book, a favorite book of later life learning centers. And yet I found myself speaking 
uh, joyfully, meaningfully, to lots and lots and lots of retired people, senior citizens in uh, uh, in their spaces who had, at the age of 70, taken up origami or guitar or painting or batik or uh, uh, haiku writing. And they found, uh, and they wanted to be able to think of their accomplishments, not as somehow secondary sort of hobbies we give old people, but as fundamentally revivifying, reanimating of their own lives. And I think that that's true. I think that the, that mm. our search for accomplishment is lifelong and always um, life-giving, life-enhancing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think those who are looking for it continuously also have the benefit of being able to find it more. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think that that's, that that's true. And again, the point I want to make is, is that it's it's the tr cruel truth of life is that we're rarely good, really good at more than one thing. We find you're a therapist. That's, you know, you're engaging people, I'm sure, is um, something that you started off doing naturally and then found you could have a vocational relationship with. Um, I'm a writer. I have the same uh, same relationship to sentences, to voice and so on. But uh, the satisfaction I get out of making music remains every bit as large as, as it was when I was 12. And uh, uh, so those, as what I call in the book, the secondary passions are often things we need to renew in order to uh, reinvigorate our primary vocations. Right. I love that term, secondary passions. It's so much better than the word hobby. I don't like the word hobby. I, I hate the word hobby. I think it's an inherently demeaning, condescending, patronizing word. And as you know, in the book, I give it its origin to, you know, the great 19th century painter, Ancre, uh, you know, did all those odalisques and wonderful portraits, great virtuoso neoclassical painter could do anything. And, uh, could do soft, could do hard edged, could do <clears throat> portraits, could do <clears throat> uh, imaginary odalisque, couldn't do landscapes really, but that was the only thing he couldn't do. <clears throat> Perfect talent. But he spent his whole life, as I discussed in the book, devoted, <clears throat> excuse me, to his violin playing. He thought his violin playing was much more important than his painting. And as a consequence, um, that expression, the violin of Ancre, the le, le violin de Ancre, has entered French as a proverbial expression, meaning not your primary vocation, but the secondary passion, which fuels your primary vocation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I absolutely love that. Back to happiness for a second. So what are your thoughts on all of those external things that people say may increase happiness? So things like, well, I was, the first thing I was going to say was a sense of accomplishment, but not in the way that you're talking about accomplishment, right? Or maybe achievement or getting to a certain status in life or relationships, connecting with other people or being successful at work or whatever it is. What What are your thoughts on that in terms of happiness? Well, as, as you know, in the book, I make a distinction and you, it's arbitrary in terms of the names. You could switch it around if you wanted to between accomplishment and achievement. By accomplishment, I mean all the things we've been talking about, those um, inner direct and inner driven activities, learning chords, talking to people, making patterns and so on. And achievement is what you're talking about here in my vocabulary, uh, which means um, all the outer directed things that we do because they give us success. They, we, they give us money and rewards and prestige and advancement in our careers. I'm a highly ambitious person, so I don't want to seem disingenuous about the pursuit of the value of those kinds of achievements. I do think that we do our kids a disservice when we emphasize achievement of that kind, passing the next test, getting into the select college, getting into the select graduate school, all of those things. I think that there's an emptiness to that as an activity, which sooner or later shows up in people's, in people's lives. We all know uh, people of enormous achievement in that sense who at 40 or 50 or later feel that there's a void in their lives exactly where real accomplishment ought to be. Um, I'm, I know, I won't say countless, but many people in the financial industry who will say that to you. It's, I'm only doing this so I can do that, right? I'm sure you have patients who say exactly, exactly so. So I distinguish those two things, like accomplishment and achievement. I am far from being um, indifferent to the blandishments of achievement. I pursue them too. I do think we can all feel in our personal experience 
what other kind is there, I guess, uh, that um, uh, the relative emptiness of those things. I, I mean, I think almost all of us have the experience that when we win the award or we get the prize or we get the grade or we get the acceptance letter, it's a thrill for a moment. It's a kind of sugar high, but it rarely lasts. It re rarely is something that we go back to again and again. You know, it's, uh, uh, it, the, you know, the, the sad and bitter truth is, is that some of the most successful people in the world Think of Elvis, Michael Jackson, and so on. Yeah. Were bitterly miserable in their personal lives, despite getting all of those achievements way beyond anything you and I could could possibly imagine. So it's clear there's not a very robust correlation between outer achievement and inner happiness in an inner sense of of meaning. And we all know people who are not celebrated particularly who have uh, hugely meaningful lives that yeah. um, that. Uh, radiate out on us with their own serenity and sense of meaning and accomplishment in ways that we can only envy and uh, and admire so yeah. i think that that's um uh you know achievement is a rat race if you know, like a rat maze that we run rat our maze. kids through uh we give them little bits of sugar water to reward them as they do but i think ultimately real not just real success in a spiritual way important though that is but even in a practical pragmatic way is more profoundly rooted in accomplishment than it is in achievement in that sense I, again i think of my own son who i write about in the book when he was 12 he didn't pick up a guitar he picked up a pack of cards and started teaching himself hard magic as so many 12 year old kids do boys and girls but boys more often than girls with that particular obsession and all of his kind of implicit OCD and all of his adolescent anxiety was siphoned off into the cards that he in his hands you literally couldn't get out of his hands some night you'd have to go to his bed when he was asleep and take them out he didn't become a card magician though that was his ambition when he was 13 when he was 16 he discovered as many Boys have before the girls have no interest in card tricks. Absolutely none. <laughs> so he picked up a guitar and now is a professional musician. That's what he does. He's a truly good guitar player. Um, but uh the act of of accomplishment, the act of virtuosity and mastering card magic, even though he never does it now, I think it's the foundation for everything he's done since. Mm -hmm. I love your take on it's interesting because these are the kids, our kids that we raise, they were surrounded by this belief that it's all about achieve, 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 and keep going, getting to the next this and the best this and the best college and the best whatever. So, I mean, they had that, it started at such a young age. Your kids maybe are a little bit older. Maybe they were, it was just beginning. I'm not sure. Right. So my son was born in 1994, my daughter five years to the day later in Paris in 99. And, um, uh, you know, their lives were shaped, given the city we live in, the class of fortunate people we come from, all the rest of that, the nature of their parents' own drive and ambitions. Uh, they were shaped by a culture like yours, I suspect, and puts enormous uh, uh, value, enormous emphasis on achievement of a measurable kind. And they kind of had to sneak their accomplishments in through the side door. And it wasn't always uh, uh, self-evident why those things would be valuable. One of the things I, if, you know, if I have an evangelical edge to this book, uh, to all that, ha to all that happiness is, uh, it's exactly that we ought to open the door for that kind of uh, uh, accomplishment for our kids more and more, encourage them to do card tricks and sew patterns and play guitar in the, in the, quiet confidence that if they pursue those things with real passion, ultimately they will be more solid, well-grounded pedestals for real achievement later in life than driving them forward towards uh, towards the next test or the the next um, uh, select school or uh, or any of those more more conventional things. Very hard to persuade parents of uh, at least the ones I'm surrounded with in a social class. I was very unhappy my kids went to a wonderful uh so-called progressive school in manhattan but i just thought that the kids were being loaded down with far 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 too much homework and it seemed to me that nighttime at home should be a, a sacrosanct and a, a sacred precinct mm -hmm. of conversation and 
and personal accomplishment and to have them doing, you know, me essentially meaningless homework uh, where, until 3 a.m. was uh, against all the purposes of education, not to mention against the pleasures of childhood. So I led a little rebellion against it, which eventually made the front page of the New York Times because people were sort of shocked by it. And I found myself, and this was really interesting, Kara, I found myself with many allies among the teachers because the teachers said, you know, mm. I, we don't know why we're doing this, why we're giving all this. So these kids will all be fine. There's no bad outcome for any of these kids. If they screw up Spanish in eighth grade, they'll be fine, right? Um, but the other parents were the problem, right? Because their standard of excellence in education was how many kids get into Harvard. Um, that's not a good standard to, 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 to take around. But it was fascinating to me that the teachers were in favor of abolishing homework and the parents were against it. Yeah, interesting. I mean, I remember I always felt like I was swimming upstream as a parent because yes, we had, I mean, we were, we're intelligent, accomplished people, my husband and I, and of course we're in those circles as well, but I just never thought that push, 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 push was where it should be and that they should be doing all this extra work. And I felt like I was the only parent who felt like that, which was so strange. I... It's like, what? Yes. And and all the other, you know, I'm I'm blessed to have five sisters, uh, five siblings, four sisters and a brother, all of whom have PhDs and are accomplished academics. One of them is a is a is a famous uh, child psychologist, Alison Gopnik, and she made the point for me when I was in the midst of all this that there is absolutely no evidence showing that giving kids more homework does anything positive for them at all. I mean, doesn't do anything positive for them just in terms of the dumb. Does it increase their test scores? And it certainly doesn't do anything positive for them in terms of does it make their lives richer? But we're we're bound to that endless hamster wheel of of achievement and very, very hard to uh, to emancipate ourselves from it. Right. And now, so this is what I love to know what you think about also, because now we're in a situation where these kids are older and they're looking for jobs. They're graduating from college and they're getting their first jobs. And it's really hard to get jobs these days. And for these are for accomplished kids. And even when they get the jobs, you know about all the, the, the cost of living now is so high and the rents are high and nobody can afford a house in this younger generation or millennials especially, but if we're talking about Gen Z. So th they were rushing, rushing, rushing or, or driving, driving, driving to get to this point. And now they're faced with this crunch of, making this much money and their cost of living being like this. Yes. I Listen, I'm living that, Kara, right now. Both of my kids have graduated from college. One of them is living up in Buffalo with his girlfriend, in part because they can live quite well in Buffalo in a way that they can't live in New York on, uh, on uh, you know, tutoring money and fellowship money. My yeah. other one's here in New York, and she's just gotten her first job, right? But like so many first jobs in this in the world we live in now, it's an internship, right? It's right. paid, but it's not munificently paid. And there's built-in frustrations that my I don't know what your first job was. My first job was as if you couldn't believe this, as the grooming editor of GQ magazine back in the days when it was a fashion magazine. I've written about it in my book at the Stranger's Gate. And I loved having that job. First of all, because though it didn't pay well. By I was too innocent to know how unwell it paid. Right. It paid enough to pay for a space for my wife and I to live in downtown Manhattan in 1980. So that was 1983. So that was in itself good. And yes, one felt that one's foot was on the ladder of ascension. Yes. And that's something that kids today do not feel. The Gen Zs, I, mean, I can never keep them straight. Millennials, Gen Zs. Gen yeah, Gen Z's, well, your kids, I think, are Gen Z because they're Gen yeah, and the, maybe they're, on, they're right. on the cusp. Right, right, right. They're, yeah, they're on the millennial Gen Z cusp. So I, I recognize that that's a that that's a that's a real problem. And, you know, there are, eight, you know, eight kids living in a two room, a two bedroom apartment in Brooklyn yeah. and kind of dormitory style. And it's charming until it isn't. Right. And that's just and it's built in that way. Let me just add, Car, I want to because I think it's important. Right. We're talking in appropriately so correctly so about uh, our own kids, the class of people that we know best. And, but I don't want this book to be exclusively about the lives of the fortunate, because I think that the, exactly the same principles hold in everyone's life. I mentioned you know, Don Patterson, who, as I say, was a very poor working class Scottish kid when he discovered origami. Seen in the life of my own father, who was uh, truly uh, 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 poor, 
immigrant working class Jewish kid whose father had never graduated <clears throat> past the eighth grade and spent his life working as a as a laborer and as a, eventually as a small scale grocer and so on. And yet my father made that same leap when he discovered reading. Uh, now, I didn't have to leap into reading because my father had sort of set that up for me, as you can see, mm -hmm. as a as a given. But his guitar were, were the novels of Dickens, right? And which he discovered at the age of 12, right? And it took him into another world. So I want to emphasize, I think, that it would be a huge... And Dickens, by the way, a very poor working class London kid, discovered the novels of Fielding. And that's what gave him that, that first sense of absorption, self-escape and ultimately happiness. So I, I think it'd be a huge mistake to ghettoize this to the concerns of one social class. But uh, but coming back to your question, yes, I, you know, I think that they are having a harder time of it uh, than we are. But I don't think that speaks so much to their capacity for meaning, for happiness, mm -hmm. if you like. That seems to run fairly fluid through lives, exactly because in so many ways it's apart from, independent from, uh, the obvious kinds of social achievement. Every generation has its struggles with success, but those are in a certain sense parallel to, but different from their struggles for meaning. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. It's he it's what I hear from all the kids these days, I guess now is what a struggle it is because that was, that was emphasized really for them is the achievement. And so that's the situation. That's everything. We, we set them up for the yes, fall. Yes, yes. So yeah, we need, and who knew what was going to happen post pandemic and what the, the conditions of the world were going to be. And then there's the pandemic too and how that impacted. That's a whole other story. We, that's a whole other uh, chat. I wrote a long piece just to add. I, I wrote a long piece in the New Yorker just a few weeks ago about 2020. What were the lessons of 2020? And I think that's a, those are real questions that we haven't begun to find the answers to. Yeah. So the New Yorker, that's just fascinating. You've been there forever. What don't people know about it? What What about the New Yorker? Good question. I've been there almost 40 years now. I've been, I, you know, the New Yorker for me is not a job, though I'm lucky to have, in, in the world we're describing, I'm lucky to have it as a job for, as I say, almost 40 years now. Um, but I feel myself to be more a citizen of that country than an employee of that firm, or if you're like a soldier of that army. Uh, the things I think that people don't know about it is that it's a numbingly unglamorous place and pursuit. You know, people, it's not a place. What was that movie, The French Dispatch, right, where it gave it a kind of a, a New Yorker like thing, a certain glamour and gloss. I've been there 40 years and I've never yet got the glamour and the gloss of it. Uh, it's, I, I don't go, I, for years and decades, I went into the office all the time when we were, our offices were in the West 40s in various places. Uh, and um, uh, the only really fun was when the cartoonists all came on a Tuesday and they, they had a lot of esprit de corps. But writing is famously, but accurately, a lonely business of, mm -hmm. of, of sweaty people locked in little offices. When I first arrived at the New Yorker, there were still some... Uh, surviving members of the kind of golden generation, the people who had made the magazine in the 1930s and 40s, Philip Hamburger and Joseph Mitchell and so on. And that was thrilling. Brendan Gill, uh, that was thrilling to meet them and to feel yourself in touch with a, uh, a golden thread, a golden line of uh, accomplishment, of literary accomplishment. Uh, so the, all of those things I think are positive about it. The thing that I think people easily miss about The New Yorker, perhaps in comparison with any other magazine, is that we are primarily a magazine of reporting, uh, criticism and reporting and humor, rather than of punditry, if you, if you know what I mean. Uh -huh. I'll give, you know, we don't, I'll give you an example that in a sort of, you know, particularly uh, intense and maybe vivid way dramatizes it. I just did a piece, it was not my most recent piece, my most recent piece was, was about baseball in New York in 1908, but just before that, I did a piece about books on uh, Hitler's rise in 1932, what happened. And exactly my training as a reporter told me, don't draw parallels between what's going on in the country right now and what happened then. Report the books you're writing about, try to report that time, and then let the readers draw their own parallels, discover their own parallels. I was well aware of them, but it would have been inelegant as a rhetorical strategy, it would have been a form of punditry to say, don't you see all these parallels? Now, on when I go on podcasts, I talk about it, but I wouldn't do it on the page. 
And so there's a certain value that the New Yorker is always placed on indirection uh, that is special, I think, to the magazine and to the traditions, the literary traditions of the magazine. And then the other thing that I think can't be emphasized enough is that the New Yorker started off as a comic weekly. And that's what it was called by its founders almost 100 years ago next year. Uh, it will be 100 years uh, next year. It's called the Comic Weekly. And I still think there's a substratum of comedy, of humor, or ought to be, in everything uh -huh. we do and everything we write. Um, humor is our default mode. And even when I'm writing about an extremely serious subject, like Hitler, I try to make sure that the piece is in the first instance delightful to read, that you don't want your time back. It's a, nothing should be a chore to read. It should always be a pleasure, even if the material you're writing about has nothing pleasurable about it. Right, right. That just reminds me of I had um, I've interviewed Jesse Eisenberg a few times. I've had him mm -hmm. on and he writes occasionally. I don't know if he's written recently or not. not so recent. Yes, but he has written. Right. Yeah. But right. I think of him as that same kind of thing where he, there is always that humor there behind whatever he's presenting. Yeah. Even the even the the great serious writers of the magazine. I think of John Updike, for instance, a great novelist who was a citizen of the magazine and uh, I sort of got laying on of hands from him when I joined. Uh, and he said to me once, uh, humor is always my default mode. Humor is always my default mm. mode. Now, now Updike wrote about sex and suburbia and death and and uh, the fabric and texture of American experience. But that was always the uh, the foundation. In fact, so much so that he was a uh, an editor of the Harvard Lampoon. And my daughter once showed me the bed at the Harvard Lampoon on which he was said to have lost his virginity. So you, you can't ask for much more than that <laughs> in the way of uh, comic bona fides. Interesting. So you'll stick with The New Yorker uh, indefinitely, it sounds like. As long as they'll have me, I'll I'll stay. As I say, it's not my job. It's my cause. Uh huh. And you go in? So you do go in sometimes or not I, so much? I, I, since the pandemic, to be perfectly honest, almost not at all. I went in the other day because I was doing a podcast with David Remnick uh, and I was like Rip Van Winkle coming back to Sleepy Hollow. <laughs> Everybody said, like, oh, and you know, there's all these wonderful 20 something kids. And I was just a rumor to them. And they were astonished that I. That's that so I, funny. So you were like a rumor, right? You were just a rumor. Stand, but they must have been really excited to meet you, I would think. I, I don't know if it would go all the way up to really excited, but they were they were startled. It made a break in the day to meet someone who they knew as a name within the magazine all these years, but whom they whom they hadn't hadn't seen. You know, um, I think it was, uh, uh, as I say, it was like meeting Rip Van Winkle. You didn't you know, you had written him off or they think I'm a syndicate, you know, like the guys who wrote the Nancy Drew books, you know, it's like eight people producing all the different right. stuff. But I mean, you, do, you are quite. Pro sorry, you are quite prolific. Quite. I am prolific, and I make I make no apologies for it. Uh, and horizontal, as we were talking about before. Uh -huh. um, but um, the one thing I will say is, I think that writing as an accomplishment, coming back to our our first subject, uh, is one of those things that actually there are very few things in life that don't bend to passionate perseverance and writing does more than most things the more you do it i never want to say the easier it gets because it should never be easy but the more come back to something you you were talking about when we began the easier the transition between your spoken voice and your written voice becomes you know and so the this i'm always trying to limit the space between my sound and my fingertips and i think that Bye. gets Oh, I, I don't know if that's true or not, but I, what I will say is, is that I love writing. I've always liked writing, and I, now I actively love it. So, um, uh, though I'm, I'm, I suppose, um, uh, shamefully pro prolific, I'm not uh, uh, um, uh, embittered. I love to write, and I love to get my stuff out in the world. Yeah, yeah. So you probably, I'm guessing, you have all these other ideas that are just kind of waiting to be. Yeah, yeah. In. I'm, well, you know, I'm. I have a whole second semi-secret life as coming back to the guitar in my lap at the age of 12 as a librettist and a lyric writer for musicals. So I have one that I did with the great composer David Shire called Our Table. You can find it on Spotify, the original cast recording. And now I'm working on another one with David and one with the wonderful composer Andrew Lippa. So that's a way of 
of expanding my lungs. And I began as a critic, you know, writing art criticism, and I still like to go back and do that. So you have, you know, you you you're I'm a utility infielder in the on the great baseball team of literature. Yeah, yeah, okay. Do you feel famous? My son Luke, when he was about nine or ten years old, was trying to explain the peculiar nature of his father's renown to someone else. And he said, um, he's very serious and brilliant boy. He said, um, every other grown up knows my father, <laughs> meaning like not half the grown ups have never heard of me, but every other grown up, if you went down a row of grown ups, every other grown up would know your father. I always, always thought that make a good title for a memoir. Every other grown up story of an. Of yeah, you're an good almost. at titles too. And I, I, I love titles and I'm always on the search for good titles. Every other grown up may be the name of my memoir. So that's the kind of famous that a writer gets. That's about, I mean, there's some writers, Salman Rushdie on a tragic level or um, uh -huh. Stephen King on a positive level or J.K. Rowling on a level both positive and, and negative these days uh, who achieve fame beyond that. But I think uh, I think for writers, every other grown up is about, is about as much as you can hope for. Right. So you feel good about it. You feel good about every other grown up. You feel good about yeah, I do. You know, I feel that I've got, here's what I feel good about, right? I'm I'm a greedy and ambitious person and I wish all my books sold 10 million copies. And I think my dear and beloved friend, Malcolm Gladwell could not publish a book for a little while. And give us the rest <laughs> of it. A little, all of the, I'm, an, I'm a competitive and ambitious person. So of course I have those feelings, but um, the great gift that um, arriving young at the New Yorker gave me was a sense of audience. I've never felt neglected. I've often felt beleaguered, persecuted, um, assaulted, but I've never felt neglected. And I think of all the bad things that happen to a writer, that's the worst, the sense that your writing isn't isn't landing in any way right. in the world. And, um, and that gift of, of a sense of an audience, and I, I should add, you know, it's without being sentimental about it or being sentimental about it. I did, you know, a book tour last year with, um, the real work, my previous book, of which all the happy, all that happiness is, is a kind of codicil or a postscript. Um, and you know, I met countless elderly people who said, hey, "It's a pleasure to meet you. We grew up with you. You know, I've been reading you all my life." Or it's a scary thought, or for a very long time. So that sense of being entwined in the lives, minds, and souls of your readers is uh, unbelievably. A uh, precious one, and one that mm. I, mm -hmm. one that I, I value. Though when I started out, they used to say, "Oh, you're much younger than I thought you would be," and now they say, "You're much shorter than I thought you would." <laughs> so we pass from one dimension of measure to another. And you and Malcolm, you're really good friends, you buddies. Yes, 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 yes. Well, we don't see each other as much as I wish we did, but yes, we're very, uh, we're very good friends. Have been for a long time. I have, uh, uh, we we talk. He's always got. My, we, I've said, told this story a million times, but my kids always, in our family, he was known as not that you're not dead, Malcolm, because my kids absolutely adore Malcolm. And he would come for dinner and they would be goggle-eyed as all of his readers are and say, Malcolm's the most interesting storyteller, not that you're not dead. Or Malcolm always finds the one right example, and not that you don't dead, but he always finds, and so not that you don't dead, Malcolm is, is a welcome visitor to this table. I can only imagine the conversations. They must be wonderful for both of you. If, and if you were fly on the wall, it must be fabulous too. He's a brilliant mind. And he always, as the kids point out, has something original to say, not that I don't. Right, right. Always. Okay. So my last question to you is, this is really famous. So I do interview famous people, but I'm really interested in who they really are. So hold on, let me get rid of this. I'm sorry. Okay. But I'm most interested in who my guest really is. So if I were to ask you, who is the real Adam Gopnik? What would you say? It's funny you say that about podcasts. I once was on a podcast with a very celebrated person who said to me very innocently at the beginning, we usually have very well-known people on this podcast, but I thought for once we'd have somebody I admire just for their work. Who is the real Adam Gopnik? Um, I love to cook. That's my great secondary passion. So I think my kids, if when they when they remember me, will probably remember me either disappearing into this room for six hours a day to write or where they saw me, which was in the kitchen uh, cooking dinner uh, night after night. The real Adam Gopnik is, um, uh, I don't know, um, someone of 
uh, of uh, maybe a good way to put it, Kara, is someone of uh, simpler, of a complicated intelligence and simple pleasures. Does that make any sense? In other words, I spend my life responding to books and arguments to understanding Hitler's ascent in 1932 or the nature of the information revolution and so on. And I love doing that work. You know, in some ways, I'm a college student for life. I always have another term paper to get in. Um, and I value the complications of intelligence more than any other virtue, I might say. But the things that delight me are uh, dinner table conversation and apart from all the obvious sensual pleasures we all share and um, uh, great hockey games and um, skating in winter and uh, boxing on, on Saturday mornings with my daughter. So uh, if there's a part of me that's, uh, that's real, more real than, than the other parts, it's, um, it's the, the slightly clownish um, and physically awkward, but nonetheless completely impassioned participant in the simple pleasures of the body. Accomplishment. I hear accomplishment in there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Fabulous. Now, the boxing is for me now what guitar was for me at 12 because I've surrendered my guitar pretensions to my son, who's really good. And I guess you don't think that you will ever be a pro fighter. My daughter keeps saying, that she wants to put a purse together to pit me against a friend we have as a theater director who's also studying <laughs> about She's gonna get her her wealthy college friends to put together a significant purse and then she'll pit us against each other for money and we'll do it for uh, for charity at some point. But no, unless they can find another five foot four, 65 year old Jewish intellectual who wants to fight, I, my fighting will be done abstractly in a gymnasium. I love it. Thank you, Adam. What a great conversation. Thank you, Cara. I enjoyed every minute of it. All right. That was Adam Gopnik. Pick up a copy of his book, All That Happiness Is, at my Amazon storefront. That's amazon.com slash shop slash really famous. I'll be back very soon with some brand new talks. So stay tuned. Thanks for hanging out with Adam and me. I'll talk to you soon. Hi, I'm Adam Gopnik, the uh, the writer, and uh, I, Kara and I just had a wonderful conversation about everything from uh, guitar chords to homework to the meaning of life and beyond. Uh, um, I hope you'll enjoy it. I did. Thank you. I love it. No, I I, enjoy, I just thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. We we kept the ball going across the court. I thought very effectively. Loved it. I I, I enjoyed I enjoyed it completely. This episode is brought to you by Progressive. Are you driving your car or doing the laundry right now? Podcasts go best when they're bundled with another activity, like Progressive Home and Auto Policies. They're best when bundled, too. Having these two policies together makes insurance easier and could help you save. Customers who save by switching their home and car insurance to Progressive save over $775 on average. Quote a home and car bundle today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $779 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Not available in all states. Okay, it's official. We are very much in the final sprint to Election Day. And face it, between debates, polling releases, even court appearances, it can feel exhausting, even impossible to keep up with. I'm Brad Milkey. I'm the host of Start Here, the daily podcast from ABC News. And every morning, my team and I get you caught up on the day's news in a quick, straightforward way that's easy to understand with just enough context so you can listen, get it, and go on with your day. So kickstart your morning. Start smart with Start Here and ABC News because staying informed shouldn't feel overwhelming. <laughs>